each met at different times. I think I met Brian first, maybe? We were playing with Delphio Marsalis. I was still in college. I remember the first time I got hit the blade, I saw, I saw you on television, and you were playing with Delphio. There you were, and you was swinging so hard. I was That's like, who, who is that cat? <laughs> and, and I remember, Brad, I remember I met you down at the Village Gate, yeah. you know, and I was blown away, and that was 92. I saw Christian play, I saw you play a lot, but I don't think I ever had the gumption to go up to you and introduce myself. Marianne was, uh, to, oh my God, you gotta meet Joshua Redman, he's the next big thing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, she was right. <laughs> I mean, it was such an intense and formative year and a half yeah. of my life, you know? And again, like, I feel like whatever that thing is that the four of us had, it sure has survived 25 years and it's right there, you can feel it. It's just in the way that we relate to the beat and the way we relate to each other's sounds. Due to Joshua's vision and imagination, <laughs> there's a spiritual alchemy that occurs, which we really have nothing to do with. <clears throat> there, there is something, you know, that binds us. The reason why Josh immediately attracted me, what he was doing already, was he was looking for ways to bring not just jazz, but other music that he loved and, and grew up with, and to bring that into the fold. So when we were on the road, it's like Christian had all these James Brown bootlegs, and Brian had all this great Roots Rock, and Josh and I were getting into this, like, like Alice in Chains. And, Alice and, yeah. <laughs> and it was great. We were all turning, turning each other on to stuff, and it was really cool. You know? And then, of course, we had the common thing. Of, we had all listened to the same records. We're referencing a, a body of work, you know, that, that was closest to all of our hearts, right. you know, which is this great swinging sound of, of modern jazz. But what always strikes me, the biggest difference of our generation or earlier and a younger generation is the way we receive music. There was a limitation. You'd buy a record and you'd sit with that record for weeks because you actually bought it, you paid for it, and then you'd absorb that fully. Right. And now yeah. everything's available, yeah. which I think is a blessing and a curse. My sense is that if you're passionate about music, you can get a lot, a really wide range of information very, very quickly. Yeah. And you can develop a lot in that way. Yeah. But um, sometimes I wonder how deep you're actually going. Like yeah. we had to, yeah. We, yeah, like you're saying, we had, a, we had to make choices. We had to buy the record, sit with the record, right. you know? I mean, I remember even in the early digital age, like going on the road with CDs, you had to little, choose yeah. how yeah. many CDs. Like, I'm gonna take a little case, yeah. you know? Right. I'll, I'll, right. I can take 10 CDs. These are the yeah. 10 CDs right. I'm gonna listen to for the next. On this tour. Yeah, on this yeah. tour. Right. Right. Both Benny Green and Joshua Redman, two of my greatest friends and two bands that I've played in, they take great painstaking measures to make sure the arc of the set the is right. Is. There's this really incredible balance of the spiritual and the intellectual that I just wasn't used to seeing. You know, Someone say Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> no, I don't know if it'd be that far. Um, I because would say because it. both Josh was a nice. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, in general, you really take great. I mean, care I'm neurotic, of so you know. Oh, <laughs> no, there is a duality. You know, yeah. I mean, I do. I have a very, very kind of, you know, obsessive, neurotic aspect to my personality. You know, and that can come out in the set planning. You know. Um, but one of the great things about music, one of the reasons why I think I play music is because in the actual act of making music, I'm released from that. One thing you do that's very unique as a soloist, and I feel like that's been a big influence on me, is that you will leave a space in your solo, you'll wait for someone to give you an idea. Well, sometimes, sometimes that's all I'm doing, because I feel like I don't have, I mean, honestly, yeah. like I feel like I, my, all my ideas come from, you know, come, come from outside of me. And then you wait to see what somebody else well, will, will give think, back. I do think that that is... And not is, everybody does that. I do think that, that is that is a feature of what the four of us have. Like, like there is it's this sense... a feature sense. of you as a leader. Well, I and, and we've I just mean, I, I know, the compliments. I, I... <laughs> <laughs> but 
But there is a sense, I think, when the four of us play together of there's this ebb and flow in the music and I, like an idea, whether it's a melodic idea or a rhythmic idea or a harmonic idea, can get passed back and forth. There's that attention that, that we're building something together, you know? Mm. It's not this, dispo this taste it and toss it, you know, this disposability or the moment, <laughs> you know, is precious. It's like how, how uh, uh, an idea is going to be phrased, how a, uh, what, how a groove is going to be felt, like in each moment, it's like it's pregnant with possibility, you know, and that's something that I feel really strong with you guys, and I, and I think I felt it early on, I mean, immediately with you guys, and that sense of, of every moment being pregnant with musical possibility or spiritual possibility.